and welcome everyone once again to Strategies to Support Young Children with ONH, uh, being presented to us by Julia Bowman and Sarah Edwards. And I'm going to hand this over to you. Okay, so for those of you who don't know us, I'll start introducing myself. I'm Julia Bowman. I'm one half of the Birth to Three program at Illinois School for the Visually Impaired. I've been in this position for about 12 years. Prior to that, I was a scientist, but that all changed when my daughter Mary was born with visual impairments. And since we were living in Boston at the time, we were supported by Perkins School for the Blind and were able to participate in the Perkins Infant Toddler Program. And from there is where I um, found my new career and my love for birth to three early intervention services for little ones with visual impairments. Okay, and I am Sarah Edwards. I'm the other half of the Birth to Three program at ISBI. Um, my story is very similar to Julia's. Um, our paths definitely crossed um, due to our children. Um, I have been a teacher for students with visual impairments in the early intervention program for about 10, 11 years now. Um, similar to Julia, I did something totally unrelated. I actually worked in the actuarial field. Um, I was in early intervention with my two kids. Both of my kids have Lieber's congenital amaurosis. And so they receive DTV services. Um, my DTV always encouraged me to go back to school and get my vision degree because um, she simply wanted to retire <laughs> and needed a replacement for our area. And she said, you know more than we do because you live it. Um, I kind of pushed back for a couple years, but then when my youngest started school, I did decide to go back and I did get my teaching degree um, and I have no regrets. I think that this is exactly where I was meant to be. So Julie and I have been working together for about the past 10 years. Okay, so before I get started, I just want to say we um, expect this webinar to go a little over an hour. We'll still have plenty of time for questions, but if you're watching the clock and you go over a little over an hour, don't be surprised. Okay, so today we're going to continue the discussion we started in part one of our series. Um, in part one, we talked about the medical aspects of optic nerve hypoplasia, and today we're going to talk about strategies to support little ones with optic nerve hypoplasia. Ooh. So every child with ONH is unique, but Sarah and I have found over the years there are some commonalities in terms of strengths and challenges. Let me start with strengths. So for many students with ONH, they have an intense love of music. And our little ones enjoy finger plays and songs and instruments. And we can use this as a strategy. And later on in the presentation, we'll talk about how we do that. Many of my students with ONH have a great interest in letters, numbers, shapes, and colors, or any combination thereof. Um, many of my two-year-olds are reciting the alphabet, they're counting, they love discriminating shapes and doing shape sorters. And I found even my, my young ones who have um, lower cognitive functioning tend to love activities that revolve around sorting shapes and colors. Rote memory and imitation. As we mentioned in part one, many of our students have a good expressive vocabulary and not as much receptive vocabulary. So they can memorize what they hear, they can imitate and they can repeat that, but we can use that to our advantage. And finally, many of our students are mobile. So whether they're rolling, crawling, or walking or cruising, they can access their environment by moving. Now, this doesn't include every single student, but there are probably the statistical majority are, are mobile. So now looking at challenges. Um, and we mentioned in part one that the majority of our students with ONH have some type of developmental delay, but there are wide variations across the area. So is it cognitive? Is it motor? Is it adaptive social language? And also level of severity. Mood, temperature, and sleep issues are often caused by that miswiring of the hypothalamus because those are autonomic processes. They're regulated by the hypothalamus. And then because of those medical issues, children with ONH have difficulties with regulating these factors. 
health issues and medication side effects. We know that the statistical majority of students with ONH have endocrine issues such as a hormone deficiency. And so they are most often on a medication. And later on in the presentation, I'll show some of those side effects, which can be very disruptive to a child's day. Behavioral challenges. All of part one discussed how the medical aspects and the sensory aspects of ONH can manifest as behaviors. So we're definitely gonna address that today. And finally, atypical reactions to sensory stimuli. This is probably the number one thing that I hear from parents is you know, talking about sensory issues and how can we address those. So we're going to break it down into different categories of intervention. We'll talk about behavior strategies, social skills strategies, language strategies, and visual strategies. And I'm gonna start with behavior, but before I do that, I just wanna make a disclaimer. I am not a behavioral expert. I'm not a behavioral specialist, neither is Sarah. Um, and if families are struggling with severe and intensive behaviors, we do recommend that the family makes um, asks for a referral, whether it be from early intervention or from a medical professional to a behaviorist so that they can get that additional support that they need. But I do also feel that as teachers of students with visual impairments, we have some valuable tools in our toolkit to help families along in this journey as they're dealing with difficult behaviors. So that said, I'm going to state my firm belief that all behavior is communication. And this has really been reinforced by my experience as a parent. My daughter is nonverbal. She's 18 years old now. So I've had a lot of years of practice trying to interpret her behaviors and understand what she's trying to tell me. And most of them I have figured out, but not all. Um, and so this was reinforced for me, this behavior is communication um, by our own experience with a behaviorist. He taught me to take a systematic view. So going through behaviors, looking for physical or medical reasons why my child might be exhibiting behaviors. And I took this and expanded on it and added an educational perspective. So my list here um, is a combination of those physical causes, but also other issues that might affect our little ones with ONH and might cause some of these behaviors. So let's look at these one by one. So first, looking at physical issues. So first I'll point out at the bottom of, of my slide, I have a link to the Challenging Behaviors Toolkit that was put together by Autism Speaks. This is really helpful if you're looking at possible physical causes, especially those that are invisible. So you, they might not be obvious or apparent. Um, there are, at the very end of this toolkit, there's a list of a number of physical reasons why a child might be exhibiting behaviors. It's a good place to start. Um, in our family, allergies uh, can be a reason for discomfort and behavior, just that itchy feeling or goopy eyes or just feeling like you're underwater. And for our children, our very young children, they don't understand why they're feeling this way. So they're trying to communicate that they're unhappy. But it can be any chronic um, condition causing physical distress. Pain is definitely an issue. And this could be pain due to some of those hormone deficiencies, due to muscle tone issues, um, positioning discomfort. We know that, that so many of our kids who have tone issues, they have trouble in certain positions. They, need, they might just need to be adjusted or they might need to change position. Um, hunger and thirst. This is one of the uh, effects of hormone deficiencies that intense hunger and thirst, and that can feel like pain or discomfort um, and constipation. It's another one of both side effects and um, hormone deficiencies that, that cause constipation. And it can be so painful for little ones. And they, again, they don't understand why they're feeling this way. And they're just trying to communicate that they're, they're hurting. Um, medication side effects. I'm going to show you in a couple slides some of those side effects that, uh, that our little ones are dealing with. And you might be surprised at how many there are. <laughs> Um, and finally, sleep. We know that our little ones with ONH have difficulty with regulating sleep, with having a normal sleep schedule, and so they might just be exhausted. So here are some of those medication side effects, and I only have four listed. So this is not a complete list of all of the medications that our, our children with ONH might be taking. They could be taking one, they could be taking all of these or com another combination and with some other medications, but just looking at this list, I just 
I don't know that I would deal very well with these side effects myself as an adult who understands, you know, that medications do have side effects and that that's a trade-off for, um, month for keeping these hormones in check, but it can, you know, looking at nosebleeds, headaches, constipation, muscle and joint aches. We were talking about pain, sleeping problems, appetite changes. These are a lot of issues for infants and toddlers to be dealing with. So they can obviously cause them to feel distressed and express that to us. So moving on from medical issues for which, you know, we would suggest that parents talk to the medical team and see if any adjustments can be made to make a child more comfortable. Um, now we're going to move on to what I call developmentally appropriate. And actually, I'm taking this from active learning. So my link is at the bottom if you want to read more about um, this component of active learning. So what I'm asking is, um, is the task that I am asking the child to complete um, does that match the child's developmental level? But I need to break that down even further. I don't, you know, I need, don't look at overall development. Look at each area of development and say, and ask, does the child have the motor ability to complete the task? Does the child have the receptive language to understand my request? So we've mentioned that children with ONH have a lower receptive uh, vocabulary. They have less receptive language than they do expressive. So they might not understand and they might just repeat back what we've said to them. They might imitate a few words, but not really comprehending the instructions. And then on the flip side, do they have the expressive language to respond? So not just imitating me, but saying yes, or I don't understand, or tell me more. And then does the child have the social and emotional skills to interpret the communication? So do, do they understand that um, serve and return? Like I'm asking them something, they should respond back, not just imitate me or, you know, go and <laughs> do something else, that there should be an exchange of ideas. And finally, is the task too easy? And we'll talk about that in a couple of slides. But let's zoom in a little bit more on developmental appropriateness. Um, so social and emotional development for a child with visual impairment, and especially a child with optic nerve hypoplasia, that level might be different than physical, cognitive, or motor levels. So knowing that, it's important to look at that particular level of development and then choose a task that matches that level, that social, emotional, developmental level. It's also important to recognize your students' behaviors in the context of their social and emotional developmental level. And I just put two examples. Um, for example, at zero to two months, grabbing and pinching is a request for contact, not aggression. But when you have a chronologically two and a half year old and you see this behavior, you might not immediately think, oh, well, that really lines up with their social emotional developmental level. You might just think they're being aggressive. Um, Similarly, at 10 months social emotional developmental level, a child might hit an adult with an object to get their attention. Again, this is not aggression, but you know, when you're looking at an older child, maybe a, even a teenager who's doing this and not looking at it through the lens of their developmental level versus their chronological age, it might be confusing. So next, boredom. Boredom is another reason children might be exhibiting behaviors. Um, I mentioned on the uh, developmentally appropriate slide that a child might not be interested in a too easy task. And I know from my own experience that sometimes, you know, children are asked to repeat a task because they, they're able to do it, but then they're asked to repeat it over and over and over and eventually they become bored and, you know, they're no longer interested and they might show some behaviors to express that. Also, when, when we're looking at any child with a visual impairment, that child might not be aware of opportunities to explore. So they might not engage in independent play because they're just not aware of what, uh, you know, what there is to explore and play with. A child might also not be able to access materials due to motor challenges. You know, so we add in that lack of incidental learning and awareness to motor challenges and we have a child who you know, really is only able to access his or her, her own body for entertainment and sensory input. And I wanna take a look at this chart here on the side that shows um, how children spend their day looking at, sorry, looking at a non-disabled child 
versus a disabled child. And so the non-disabled child is participating in gross motor activities, fine motor activities, communication, playing independently and playing with other children. Whereas a child with a disability is doing activities of daily living, they're doing therapy and doctor's appointments and playing with adults as well as spending time alone. So just thinking about the lack of opportunities, the lack of those you know, chances to practice social skills and seeing peer models and just doing different types of activities throughout the day that you can see how our little ones with, with optic nerve hypoplasia might become bored. So what do we do? We can provide access to materials. I have two links at the bottom, which will both provide you with many ideas as to how to create active learning environments and or materials. I call them stay put materials. I'm not calling that term. Um, but it really, it's a predictable environment or predictable uh, material. The child will know where the toys are and they know what to do with them. On the right, I have a picture of an active learning smock. This is actually from CVI teacher, if you wanted to look this one up. Um, it was created by Ellen Maisel. And what she did was she sewed some little curtain rings on this apron, on this smock, and then attached toys, um, some bells, and they have, you know, it's a nice black background. It was created for a child with CVI, just given those visual characteristics. But also the toys are right here at chest level. And I found that materials such as this really benefit a child whose hands are inward, whether that be due to muscle tone issues or you know just being very tight in their upper body or whether that's defensiveness and they're just drawn in and they like to keep their hands at their chest. I have a couple of students like that. But having those materials right here, that allows them that repeated access. The toys don't roll away, they don't fall, they don't go anywhere. And so that child can practice the skills, whether that be opening and closing the hand, you know, making the bells ring, grasping. And the, these environments and materials are so flexible. You can change out what types of materials you place on there. You, and it doesn't have to be a smock. I am not a talented seamstress. And so I tend to use t-shirts and then attach strips of Velcro that um, adhere to fabric. And so then I can stick toys onto the Velcro strips. And so then I'll have a little active learning t-shirt. And those have worked really well for my students whose arms are pulled in for whatever reason, because they have that continued access. So my last point here was that ch the child knows what to do once they have that material or have that environment because routines are so important. So structure and predictability are very calming to a student with optic nerve hypoplasia. But in real life, things can change. So we could um, have a new environment that a routine takes place in. There could be staff changes if we're talking about a classroom or a day program or you know music time or library story time or whatever. Um, or family changes can happen. You know who's living in the home and you know divorce or separation. So these things change a child's daily routine and that can be really upsetting. We can also look at you know if we're seeing behaviors. What time of day is the routine happening? Does, did that change? So it's just another clue. Um, what we can do is try and create mini routines throughout the day. So even if the overall picture of a child's day, week, or month will change, we can give them these predictable mini routines that they can count on and give them a clear beginning and a clear end incorporating new activities into the routine slowly and teaching laterally, and then also incorporating breaks when we're giving challenging tasks. Um, now we know transitioning in and out of routines can be difficult because it's unpredictable. The child doesn't know what's coming next once my comfortable routine has, has ended. So what we can do there is give the child a warning that the transition is coming. We can use a countdown timer, um, you know, maybe something that vibrates or ticks, makes noise. And once the child is moving into the next activity or routine, give them some time to adjust into the routine, understand the structure of the routine before we place demands. So just give them a little bit of time to adjust. We can also use music when we're talking about routines and helping children with transitions. 
So we know that music, as I said, it's very motivating to our students with ONH. It helps them to process receptive language and it helps with concept development. Those things go hand in hand. Um, it can help with transitions because the music or the activity that incorporates music provides structure and routine. And this is especially true with song boxes. So Sarah and I have talked about song boxes before. They're really just a wonderful tool. We only discovered them during the pandemic and we wish we had known about them sooner. We would have been used, using them all the time. Um, basically, they're just a collection of objects where each object represents a different song. They can really be any, any song that the child likes. Um, you can start with your own basic song box kit and adapt it as you go for an individual child. Um, and so you can do so many things with a song box, but just with respect to transitions, I can bring in a song box to say hello to my students. So our session is beginning and we start with the song box and we open it up and we go through and we choose a song to sing. And then by the same token at the end, we clean up the objects and we sing one more song and close the song box. So that it just gives it a very physical way to transition and really helps our students who love music. So sensory, we know, especially we talked about in part one, that our students with ONH have difficulties processing sensory information and that they can have atypical reactions to sensory stimuli. So in part three, we'll talk a lot about how we collaborate. Um, and in this, in this category, we'll be collaborating with our occupational therapy uh, colleagues and just trying to understand what is the child's response to sensory information, whether it be sounds, smells, textures, light, temperature, really any kind of sensory input. And then we, we try to break it into two categories. So we ask two questions. Does the child become overwhelmed by sensory stimuli or is the child seeking additional sensory input? And then from there, we can devise our sensory strategy. So if the child is overwhelmed, we would like to remove sensory stimuli. And for this type of strategy, I like to borrow from CVI experts, especially Matt Tijin, um, in terms of reducing the complexity of either the task that I'm asking the child to complete, the environment, or both. And so for environment, I put don't forget smells and temperature. Sarah and I are often in homes when meals are being prepared. And so those, those cooking smells, they can be really distracting. Or just say the temperature is either really hot or really cold. We know our students have difficulty with temperature regulation. And so that can be really distracting to them. And that just all adds complexity to the whole endeavor. So if we're going to reduce complexity, we can you know, look at the object we're asking them to interact with. We can reduce that. We can reduce the sensory environment complexity by using something such as this little bed tent. Um, we can give a sensory break. So we can have a, a tent, a parachute, or a blanket for it. I mean, we're in homes. We can throw that together pretty quickly, usually, and kids typically enjoy doing that. And it just you know, it redirects, and we can have a little escape from the sensory environment. We can also do an activity such as a walk or an errand just to get the child out of that busy sensory environment so they can just kind of regroup, reset, take a breath. Um, and sometimes that physical activity helps as well. Uh, my final strategy for reducing complexity comes from Dr. Therese Paletko, and I saw that she's joined us today. So thank you, Dr. Paletko, for this advice that um, I got from her webinars that she presented to ISBI last year. That, and it's just simply that when you feel a child with ONH is ramping up and becoming overwhelmed, we want to go low with our pitch in terms of our voice and slow down. And I'll even add to that simplify vocabulary. So I just, when I have a little one getting really, really worked up, what I'll do is just use a very short phrase and lower my pitch and slow my pace of speech that again, it just lets them reset and not have to absorb when they're already taking in so much and they're already overwhelmed. I just wanna get them something like a two word sentence, like let's walk and just get them out of that environment or you know, go to tent and you know, help them get to that sensory break without overwhelming them. 
So on the flip side, we have students who want more sensory input. So we can also add stimuli. And again, we collaborate with our occupational therapy colleagues here because OTs do a wonderful job designing sensory environments, sensory diets. Um, when I say sensory break here, what I'm saying is not taking a break from sensory, but taking a break from whatever else we're doing to add some sensory. Um, so we can do both of those things, take a break and add a sensory diet. And that sensory diet might include vestibular input, proprioceptive, we could be bouncing, jumping, swinging, doing heavy work, baby burrito um, with a blanket. We could be giving tactile input, vibrating toothbrush or vibrating face brush as I have pictured up in the top right corner or an ice roller. I've, sh I've shown that in a previous presentation, you know, thinking beyond just textures. Some kids really like cold and that helps. It's just one of those things that they want, they crave. There, if you've seen any sensory diets put together for some of your other students, you can come up with other ideas you can suggest to the team, um, but it really just depends on that individual child and what they're looking for. We can also add sensory to the task that we're doing. So for example, when we are doing a story box, we can add scent. So one of my favorite scent-based story boxes is the Sweet Smell of Christmas because it includes some hot cocoa mix and orange, um, a candy cane, which then I'll douse in peppermint extract so it really smells good, and a pine branch, all those nice strong smells. Oh, and a gingerbread cookie. Let me not forget. I'll always bake a cookie when I do that story box because those, those smells, they're just really engaging and a child who's seeking that extra sensory input that might motivate them um, to participate. Now, besides story boxes, we could be working on, as I said, letters and numbers. Those are favorites for many of my students. So I can add a texture, I can give dimension, I can use foam letters, I could do sandpaper letters, I could do pipe cleaner shapes on cardboard. I've made little flashcards that way. Um, really just let your imagination go wild, go on Pinterest and see how you can add texture, how you can add scents, you can add music, just adding that stimuli um, to whatever activity you're doing. And finally, in terms of these behavior strategies, we really, and especially in terms of sensory, we need to educate parents about their children's reactions to sensory stimuli. And again, in close collaboration with OTs, let's talk about hand under hand um, rather than hand over hand or even worse, manipulating a child's hands um, so that they're passive. Children, you know, their hands can be really sensitive. Some of our students are defensive in that they don't like to be handled. So we can introduce textures to other parts of the body. We can increase the complexity of textures. There are lots of good strategies that we can do rather than manipulating a child's hands. Um, we might use one sense at a time. Again, thinking about my CVI experts, I borrow a lot from that field. Um, beware of overwhelming environments where a child can just, you know, quickly spiral out of control. Also toys, the, the newer the toy, I feel the more that they tend to do. They can light up and sing and vibrate and roll all at once. And that itself is just it's overwhelming. So we need to think about, let's provide toys that only appeal to one sense at a time. And finally, sensory breaks as part of the daily routine. And that could be either we're taking a break from sensory or taking a break from something else to add sensory. So the next category of intervention is social skill strategies. Um, we know that many of our children with ONH have a delay in social skills development for all the reasons we talked about in part one. In addition to missing out on incidental learning opportunities, that's typical for a child with visual impairments, children with ONH have additional social challenges such as that lower level of receptive language that's affected by their sensory integration and perceptive behaviors. You know, they're just not always able to absorb um, and understand what is being said to them. They're not able to, you know, process that because of these other behaviors and other sensory issues. But fortunately, there are many excellent social skills strategies for young children with ONH that have come from the field of deafblind education. And one of them is the five phases of educational treatment. So this um, is described in detail in Dr. Nielsen's book, Are You Blind? And there are five phases, but 
in early intervention, we typically only use the first three. So it's, um, we're instructed to look at the overall, or excuse me, the social and emotional developmental level. And if that child is functioning at a level of under 24 months, we should only use the first three phases. Today, I'm only going to talk about the first phase because I think in terms of our students with ONH, it's the most important and it's also the one that we often skip. So offering, um, just, to, just to note offering, you don't have to, it doesn't have to be your first session with a child when you do offering. So if you've been working with a child for a while um, and you just kind of hit a plateau and you want to go back and try offering, you absolutely can. In offering, the most important thing is to make no demands of the child. You're simply playing near the child with a toy that hopefully will inspire them to join you. But your goal is to increase in awareness of social interaction. You want to teach the child that he or she can initiate that reaction, that interaction, that we're not going to force them. We're not going to ask them to do something. It's their, it's his or her choice that they can join into the activity. They can join in to play with us. Um, and, and that just builds trust. At the same time, in, in my experience, it might not be the first thing that I bring in that really motivates a child to interact with me. So I learn very quickly a child's likes and dislikes. I can try a whole bunch of different toys with different sensory features um, and just different properties in terms of visual, auditory, tactile, all of that. And I am taking data the whole time I'm doing offering, even if it doesn't look like I'm doing a whole lot since I'm not interacting with the child directly. So one example of offering I, that I use is my drum. This is my gathering drum. I don't often bring the drumsticks in because just how they might be used other than for drumming. Um, but often I'll have the drum and I'll be sitting and playing it in the middle of the room. I could also have a harp. I have a little auto harp that I bring in or my wind chimes or some bells or shakers. It could really be anything, but you can see the theme that many of my students like music. So I'll tend to start there. It could be a noisy toy that's crinkly or squeaky. It could be a texture blanket, but really I'll just be sitting most, most of the time in the middle of the room playing with something such as the drum and my student will eventually wander over and start playing the drum, usually on that side opposite of me, but they'll feel that I'm playing the drum because when they hit it, if my hands are on it, it won't vibrate. If my hands are off, it will. And so then we're starting to interact with each other that way. And they might get closer and closer to me and start feeling what my hands are doing. And it can just lead to such a nice social interaction where the child has initiated, where the child is active an active participant. So now I'm gonna switch uh, over and let Sarah talk about another strategy, which is coactive movement. Great, thank you. And my, so this second half will take about 30 minutes. So we should be wrapping up and ready for questions about 10 after, so. Um, all right, so we are going to start with coactive movement as another strategy for developing social skills. And coactive movement is based on the work of Dr. Jan van Dyke. And it really um, helps us gain the trust of a child. And rather than us doing something for the child, we are doing something with them. So coactive movement is really just as it sounds. We're moving together with the child and in doing so, the children are learning. Um, it could just be a simple movement that we'll have some strategies we'll share later, just simple coactive movements that we're doing with the child, but it can also be an activity that we're doing with them. And we're just kind of moving those pieces of the activity um, together. So again, children will learn new skills through different activities when we are doing something with them and not for them. So if you've ever listened to Julie and I, um, we're obviously very big proponents. We want our students and we want our children to be active participants um, while we work with them and throughout the day. And I think it was Dr. Lily Nielsen that said, you know, we want our children to be doers and not done tours. So coactive movement is, is a great strategy. This strategy actually works best when a familiar person, such as a parent or a caregiver, is the adult play partner. Because one, that child is comfortable with their parent or caregiver. They trust that parent and caregiver. So they're more likely to engage in this, in this activity. Also, the parent or caregiver is most likely going to be better at reading the child's cues. Um, they'll have a better understanding of what behaviors mean, 
um, what the emotions mean. And this is important because we want the child to stay engaged. We want them to be active participants. So the adult play partner needs to be able to read engagement cues versus disengagement cues. They need to be able to determine if those behaviors are indicating or communicating that the child is interested in the activity, they're enjoying the activity and we should continue, or are they communicating, I'm getting frustrated, I don't like this activity, I'm bored with this activity, I'm tired, and it's time to stop this activity and move on. You can go to the next slide, Julia. Thank you. Coactive movement is also a wonderful strategy because it promotes conversation with children who have limited language skills. Oftentimes we think of conversations as just um, including words, but we also know that conversations can include actions, objects, facial expressions, and movement, like these co-active movements that we're going to discuss today. These are all different responses and methods of communication that we need to keep in mind while working with our students. When having conversations or interactions with children who have limited language skills, we need to include four concepts. One, it needs to include a short turn-taking format in which the adult and child alternately engage in actions with or without objects. So that drumming, um, activity that Julia just shared would be a great turn-taking um, activity. The second concept is that we need to file, follow the child's lead in terms of their interest. So we need to learn what their interests are and let the child guide our lessons and guide our play based on their interests, based on their preferences. And we also need to participate in joint attention. If they are attending to an object, then we need to follow them and attend to that object and participate in that activity alongside them. We also need to create a playful atmosphere in which both the adult and child are enjoying their time spent together. We know from research and just from our personal experience that children learn best when they are having fun. So we need to make sure that we, you know, we are creating an atmosphere that they are having fun um, and enjoying themselves. And lastly, we always need to model communication for the purpose of commenting, describing, and requesting information. So I wanted to share an example of um, an activity, a co-active um, co movement activity that Dr. Jan Van Dyke um, did alongside with his student Tabor. And I I apologize because I may be mispronouncing this name and so I am so sorry, but that's what we're going to do moving forward. Um, and this process, this movement activity also shows um, some communication. Here's what I found. Oh, with limited language skills. So during this activity, Dr. Jan Van Dyke and Tabor and Tabor's mother sat on the floor. So Tabor's mother was the, um, was the lead. She was the trusted individual to start this activity. And Dr. Van Dyke instructed Tabor's mother to give Tabor his a, a favorite object, a preferred object. And it happened to be a, a specific sock. So she gave Tabor a sock and they gave him some time to play with it, explore it, manipulate it. And after a while, Tabor's mother then was requested to offer Tabor a second sock. Now this second sock was of a different material. It felt different, it looked different, and she had to offer it to Tabor. So she either offered it by presenting it next to him, like in front of his body, or she like placed it on the leg, you know, on his leg. Um, and when Tabor was ready, he put down his preferred sock. He grabbed the second sock, he played with it, manipulated, explored it. And then when he was done, he put it down and then he searched for that first sock and he went back to exploring that first sock. They repeated this process over and over. Tabor's mother continued to offer Tabor more socks. Sometimes she would offer one sock at a time. Sometimes she would offer multiple socks together and Tabor would pick out one and play, but the process was the same. He was offered socks, he played with them, but then he always put those down and always went back to that initial sock. During this whole process, Dr. Van Dyke gradually increased his involvement in the interaction and Tabor's mother gradually withdrew her participation. 
So once Dr. Van Dyke became the ultimate play partner in this activity, he started altering the socks. He still offered the socks in the same manner that, that Tabor's mom had been doing, but he altered them. He maybe tied two socks together, or he maybe put a knot in the middle of one sock, or he put objects inside the sock. So he altered them, but the process was still the same, and Tabor would explore them, play with them, but he ultimately always went back to that initial sock. So as you can see, this is a co-active movement activity. They did it together. Um, something wasn't done for him. They participated together. And this process was also a conversation. And it included those four concepts. One, there was turn-taking. Dr. Van Dyke and Tabor's mother offered um, Tabor an object, his stock, and Tabor took it and explored and played with it. Two, they followed his lead, right? They used a preferred object, his sock, and they let him explore as he typically would. They didn't tell him how to explore it. They didn't correct him. They didn't show him. Oh, can we go back? Thank you. They didn't um, show him how to explore or tell him what to do. They just let him explore the socks on his, on his own. Third, they created a playful atmosphere. It was slow moving. It was relaxed. Mom was involved, she's the preferred person, so she participated in this, in this activity as well. There were no demands. Like I mentioned, Tabor was allowed to, to explore and play as he wanted. And then of course there was commenting, describing um, without any verbal interactions. Tabor communicated, I like this sock the best. This is my favorite sock. I don't like that one. He did that repeatedly by always exploring the others, but putting them aside and always went back to his own sock. And Dr. Van Dyke would comment by saying, I know you like that sock, but look what else we can do with these different socks. Okay, so here are a couple more co-active movement strategies that might align a more a little bit with what you are thinking as co-active movement. Um, one is including a hula hoop. As vision professionals, we all like to use hula hoops, particularly when a child is starting to walk. You know, they can use that hula hoop as, as a pre-cane and kind of push it in front of them. I specifically like to use hula hoops just as games. It helps um, with some movement and some concept development. I like to hold on to one end of the hula hoop. The child can hold on to the other. We can raise it high up. We can raise it low. We can shake it. We can go in circles together. So these are all movements that we're doing together, um, not for them. Also, we can engage in kind of a tug and work, you know, a push and pull game. Um, that is great, particularly if the child has a weak grasp because they don't want to let go of that hula hoop. So they might strengthen their grasp a little bit. Another strategy is row, row your boat. I like to use this strategy um, to help with transitions. Like Julia was mentioning with the song box, it's a nice transition from one activity to another. Um, you can do row, row your boat while you're sitting on the floor with the child. Maybe you're behind them. You know, they're facing away from you. You're behind them. Or maybe you're sitting facing each other and you're going to row, row, row your boat together. Um, I recently had a child that was walking or could walk. He, he preferred not to walk. He preferred not to bear weight. Um, but in order to get him to stand up, he enjoyed row, row your, your boat. So if he wanted to do this, he had to stand up. So we would stand up, we would face each other and hold hands, and we would engage in row, row, row your boat. And then when we was done, then I would say, okay, walk, walk, walk. And we had to take four or five steps before we did row, row your boat again. Drumming is a nice coactive movement. Julia just shared that. Um, you don't have to have an actual drum. You can use coffee cans, you can use, you know, shoe boxes, you can use mixing bowls, um, whatever's in the home, but those are nice little co-active movement um, activities. Walking, as we've pictured um, on the top here, the little child walking on an adult's feet so they can feel that movement. Again, we're doing something together. We're not doing it for them. I have had children that um, can walk, but they kind of need to be shown that movement is kind of a trigger to their memory, like what they're supposed to do. And so once we walk around the room together, then, they're, then they just take off again. Um, rocking and bouncing are all nice co-active movement strategies as well, and those can just be included in play 
or in some type of social games. All right, so some more additional strategies for social skills is just incorporating more social games, just simply playing with a toy. Julia and I are in the homes and so often we can see the siblings and other family members and we um, can encourage them to all participate in some games together. So even if it's just simply rolling a ball or a truck back and forth, or you know, having an older sibling build the tower and the little one gets to knock it down. Oh no, now we have to build it up again. Um, these are all great social games that encourages turn-taking and some speech development while you know, doing something together with others. Pretend play is huge. Um, pretend play is very difficult for our children with vision loss because in order to participate in pretend play, you're imitating what you've seen, right? You're, you're imitating what you have seen people do in your home. You're imitating what you have seen people do in your community. And so of course, um, our kiddos with vision loss um, are, are challenged with this. Um, so it is our responsibility as parents and teachers to explain to them what is going on around them so that they have an understanding. We need to tell them, you know, what the teachers are doing in the, in the front of the classroom, what the doctors are doing, you know, how the grocery store clerks scan the items. Um, we really have to describe to them and then teach them how to engage in that pretend play so that they can play appropriately with their peers. Because pretend play is, you know, that's what little kids do, especially in preschool. And we don't want our children to be left out in that. That's just not socially acceptable. So we need to help them so that they can participate in that play as well. We also need to model appropriate play and social interactions. So social interactions, there's so many um, visual cues. And unfortunately, again, our children just miss out on um, because so many of our social interactions don't include like verbal, right? It's all, it, you're watching what people are doing. It's, it's watching their body language and, and so forth. So again, we really have to talk to our children and teach them what's going on, what people are doing, and then what's appropriate for them, right? We have to teach them um, appropriate distance, right? You, everybody kind of has a bubble when you're talking. You, I understand you want to be really, really close because then you want to touch and make sure that somebody's there, but that's not always socially acceptable, particularly with people that you're not familiar with. Um, they might not really like you that close. So that's something that we have to teach them. Um, just a simple interaction of waving, you know, people or little babies learn how to wave just by watching. So they model or they imitate that modeled behavior. Um, our kiddos obviously um, may be not able to see that wave. So we have to teach them, physically teach them how to wave and when it is appropriate to wave, you know, if somebody's entering or leaving a room. A big one for me is facing the speaker. Um, I feel as a parent with two children who have complete vision loss, I feel very strongly about this one. I can, I can handle you not making eye contact with me, but I cannot handle it when you have like your back to me and talking or looking the other way. Like you, uh, we need to teach our children how to face the speaker. It's just not socially acceptable to be looking in a different direction or having their back completely turned and engaged in a conversation. So it's our responsibility to teach them at a young age to turn towards the speaker while interacting with someone. Um, again, it's extremely important to describe to our children what is happening around them just so that they can act appropriately and they can understand um, what's going around them socially. Um, we need to um, tell them like, what, what are they hearing so that they have a better understanding? One example I always think of is my daughter when she was younger used to laugh. She thought it was so funny when she heard somebody crying. And that's, I hear that a lot from families I work with. They'll talk about how their little ones just think somebody crying is so funny. Um, and it's not, and it's not socially acceptable for us, for our kids to then laugh because somebody's crying. So I think about this and I think, but do they know that it's crying until we tell them um, that's somebody crying because they, that just may sound funny to them, right? It's a funny sound. So we need to tell them, no, that's somebody crying. You know, Lucy fell off the swing. She hurt her elbow. That's why she's crying. She's upset. Um, so we have to do that so that our kids 
act appropriately to that. You know, it's just not acceptable. Or maybe the little boy is crying in the grocery store because mom told him, no, he wasn't going to buy, he wasn't going to get the candy bar. So it's really on us to explain the whole situation. They don't get the whole picture. So we really need to describe that to them. Also, when they're in school, we need to let them know what the children are doing on the playground. Um, again, they're just missing out on these visual cues. Are the children just all kind of gathered in a circle talking? You know, are, are the girls all kind of gathered and doing like the little clapping games? Um, are the, is there a group of kids off in the side yard playing freeze tag? Um, you know, are they standing with a group and then everybody walks away, but nobody verbalized that because they just kind of all scattered and went their own way. Um, so again, it's really on us to explain to them what's happening so that they can act appropriately. So, you know, sighted kids learn how to act appropriately um, socially by watching others. And so it's our responsibility to fill in those gaps for our kids. Um, we can also provide them choices. Choices are, are great for developing social skills. Um, so we can give them, you know, opportunities to decide which activity maybe they want to do. And by doing so, they're feeling important, right? And their decisions matter. And, it, and they, they do matter. It doesn't have to be my decision all of the time. And it shouldn't be my decision all the time. So it definitely helps with some social skills, some social development to give them those choices, um, give them some self-worth and decide what's important and what matters to them. Also, um, there's no age um, that somebody shouldn't be doing a chore. So we can always find a chore in the home and in the classroom based on their age and their skill. So whether it's just picking up socks and putting them in the basket, or maybe it's emptying the basket of clothes into the washer, or maybe it's putting the spoons into the drawer, whatever it may be, um, we can find a chore for our little ones. And again, you know, it makes them feel important and they actually love, they, you mean, typically they, they really do enjoy helping out. And most importantly for social development, they start learning that what they do can and does affect others. And I think that's extremely important to give them that opportunity. All right, moving on to language. Um, these strategies are not necessarily ONH specific, um, but these are strategies that Julie and I, and um, most often, you know, we incorporate these with any children who have a vision loss to help with language development. Um, first off, we always encourage our parents to talk, um, talk all the time. Children learn language when it's incorporated into their daily routines and they hear it repeatedly throughout the day. So regardless of whatever skill we're trying to teach them, you know, whether it's language development or whether it's a concept development or maybe some type of movement, um, repetition is key. So the more often we can introduce that, um, the more likely they will master that new skill. So incorporating language throughout their daily routines also provides more opportunities for interactions and their natural interactions. So we don't need to be asking families and we really shouldn't be asking families to carve out extra time in their day to work on any specific skill. Um, we don't have the extra time and surely they don't have the extra time. Um, and all of these skills, including language development, can be worked on throughout the day. And so we just have to um, coach them and encourage them to do so throughout their daily routines. As I mentioned, we just need to talk, talk, talk. We need to describe um, what we are doing. We need to describe what is happening um, around them so that they have a better understanding so that they get the big picture. We need to tell them what they are hearing, what they are smelling, what they are touching. Because if we don't explain that to them, then they have no idea. So um, an example would be yesterday, um, you could have gone out into my community, it would have been a great opportunity to teach a little one that what they were hearing was a bunch of lawnmowers. It was the, um, I would say the, the beginning of the lawnmower war season of 2023. And so now we'll hear lawnmowers until it snows again at the end of the year. But, um, you know, until we describe to them, those are lawnmowers, 
And then why are there lawnmowers, right? Why do you need to cut your grass? And I mean, it just ends up being a whole lesson. But again, until we explain that to them, they have no idea what they're hearing. Um, you know, what? that's a dog barking out in the back, you know, across the yard, or that's a plane up above. Or if we're walking downtown and the city bus, you know, that was a city bus that just went by us really fast and you can smell the exhaust now. Or maybe we walked by a bakery and we have to explain what that smell is. You know, you smell the bakery, they make the cookies and the donuts. So again, we just have to talk, talk, talk. Um, when my children were in early intervention, that was the one thing that I remember my DTV telling me is saying, talk, Sarah, you have to talk. Believe it or not, I'm not really a big talker. So she had to teach me how. She said, you have to explain everything. Put Ethan in the grocery cart, take him down the freezer aisle and talk about how cold it is. And she said, and don't mind everybody else. They're gonna look at you and think you're crazy, but that's okay because this is what Ethan needs. This is how he's going to learn. Open up the freezer door, put his arm in so you can talk about how cold it is because he doesn't understand cold until he puts his arm in there. And then you explain like that's where the popsicles are. Or that's where the chicken nuggets are because a sighted child can ride in the grocery cart and point at the popsicles and communicate that that's what they want. Our children cannot, you know, as far as Ethan would know the ice cream sitting out on the counter. They don't know that it needs to go in the freezer until we teach them it needs to go into the freezer and why. So it's just so important to just talk. Um, Julia touched on that when we are in the homes, they're often preparing meals. You know, that's the hamburger sizzling. Um, mom's cutting an onion. Can you hear her chop? You know, let's explore the onion hole. Let's explore the onion cut up. Let's smell the onion. So we need to find all of these opportunities um, for them to develop language and have a better understanding of their world. Also, when we talk, we need to use appropriate pronouns and be clear as to who we're referring to. Pronouns are very difficult for our children, and they may not be aware of who is in the room or who is around them. So if I just say she is unhappy, um, someone may not have any idea of who she is. So we need to be very clear. Um, when we're playing, you know, alongside, we need to say I am playing, not mommy is playing, or I am getting dirty, not Sarah is getting dirty. Again, it's just very important for us to model the appropriate use of pronouns and language. All right, as mentioned in social skills, providing children with choices also builds their language skills. It gives them independence. And we just need to remember that they can let us know what their choices are by using words, by sounds, maybe pointing, moving towards or reaching for an object, um, even eye gaze. You know, if they fixate on an object for a long time, they're indicating that maybe that's their choice. Um, it's just important for us to know the receptive and expressive language abilities. Um, they may have the receptive skills to understand that this is a book and this is a ball, but they may not have the expressive ability to tell us that. So we need to know what their expressive and receptive abilities are so that we can have a better understanding of how they are going to let us know what their choices or preferences are. We need to remember to have fun, create that playful atmosphere. We can sing, we can use funny voices when reading a story. Um, we can be you know, playful, make those animal sounds or different sound effects. We can act out the stories and get them moving. You can play those different social games. Like instead of Simon says, you can play mommy says. Um, we also talked about following the child's leads. This is a great strategy for language development as well. Again, it encourages independence. Um, it gives them choices because we're letting them choose, you know, which which activity do you want to read the book or do you want to play with the ball? Um, and then we want to join in what they're doing, you know, their activity. If they're sitting there banging blocks, then we need to go find some blocks and start banging them as well. Um, Dr. Jan Van Dyke had a great example when he joined Tabor in like playing with the socks. All right, providing wait time can be very difficult for us. Um, sometimes we're not the most patient, um, but it is extremely critical and it's essential when working with um, our ONH students as well. 
Um, we need to give them time to process and respond. They may need 10, 20 or more seconds. And if we interrupt them, then they have to go back to the very beginning and start all over. We also need to watch that child very closely. Um, we need to watch their whole body. They may respond, but it may not be verbal. It might be a you know just a slight movement or maybe a really quick eye movement. So we really need to give them time and watch them entirely for a response before we decide it's appropriate for us to repeat the request or assist them. We also need to limit our questions. Julia kind of touched on this, you know, just being extremely kind of slow, low, little words, minimal words. Um, but also when it comes to questions, we don't want to ask too many at a time because obviously that would make it very difficult for them to process and they just eventually tune us out. So we need to be very simple in what we are requesting them to do. A concern with ONH kiddos too is that we see a lot they'll just kind of repeat or engage in some echolalia. So if we do ask a lot of questions, sometimes they actually will start imitating that pattern themselves as a primary form of communication. So rather than communicating appropriately, they'll just kind of ask questions all of the time. So we need to take that into consideration and we need to rephrase questions into comments when possible. So for example, instead of saying, is that pudding good? We can say that pudding looks delicious. Um, as a personally, I try to avoid yes, no questions. Um, I get myself in trouble when I say, you know, can you, cause the smart ones, you know, they're all smart, but they'll say no. And then I'm backed into a corner, um, and trying to figure out how to get out of that. So personally, I just try to avoid any yes, no questions and try to comment rather than question most of the time. Um, remember again, we just want to always use those specific nouns and descriptors. Um, so that they understand what we're asking them to do or what we are requesting them. Um, but it also helps them understand their surroundings. So instead of saying, um, get that blanket over there, we need to say, please get the soft blue blanket on the couch. All right, predictable books are also great to help with language skills. They provide rhyming, rhythm and repetition. Um, when these books become familiar, we can stop and let the child fill in the missing word or complete, you know, the sentence. We can also sing and act out the stories. It gets them moving and they're having fun. And again, when they're having fun, they're learning. So predictable books are always um, great little tools to put um, into use. And some of our favorite examples are Brown Bear, Five Little Monkeys, Good Night Moon, Peep the Cat, and I Love My Shoes. All right, I can't talk about language development and not include the story bees. Um, I call the story bees, they're story boxes, bags, buckets, boards, or bars. So really, I, 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 don't, I don't really care how you put the objects together or what container you use or whether you hang them from the PVC pipe, um, the concept is the same. So with a story box, let's say um, you, what you do is you collect actual objects to illustrate the story. These are great for, um, you know, little ones that, that don't have the vision to enjoy an actual picture. So we use the objects to illustrate the, the pictures. And while we're reading the story, they can actually explore the object. So if Clifford's going to bed, then we might have a little soft pillow that they can actually explore. So Clifford laid his head on the pillow. Um, as the child expands skills, then instead of us offering the objects, they can, we can actually request them to find the object. So Clifford's getting ready to lay his head on the pillow. You know, Lucy, can you find the pillow, please? Oh, that would be a can you. Um, find the pillow, please. Um, and so that helps with object identification and some tactile discrimination. Um, you don't have to use stories per se. If you're working on learning some different concepts, then you can fill these containers or hang items based on whatever concept um, you are introducing. It could be seasonal, such as summer, maybe um, some sunglasses, a hat, some sunscreen. Um, maybe if they have a certain interest, you know, like dinosaurs, you could fill a bucket full of dinosaurs. Maybe they have a birthday party coming up, so you could include items that would be associated with that. Um, if you're introducing letters, you can have items that start with a specific letter you're working on. Colors, you can have red boxes, blue, blue boxes, items all with that particular color, same as shapes and textures. Um, if there's a holiday that your family celebrates, you can also include items that would go along with that particular holiday. 
All right, moving on to visual strategies is our last. Um, while working with children who have ONH, we must remember um, that the visual environment does, we must make sure that the visual environment does promote the visual performance. Um, we also need to remember that acuity and functional vision does vary greatly with our kiddos with ONH. So we cannot assume that every child with ONH will use or need the same accommodations. Depending on their acuity, we may need to introduce and expose the child to braille and tactile materials. Of course, at birth to three, we may not necessarily know that the, the path that they're taking. Um, I always introduce braille and tactile materials unless, of course, the family is, is opposed to it. Um, but oftentimes, our kiddos with ONH may be visual learners and they may be dual learners. Um, so unless there's an opposition, I always expose them to, to both. Um, also, if they have functional vision, we need to present materials within their child's visual field, but we also need to encourage them to visually search for objects or people outside of their visual world. So if they have a visual cut, let's say on their right side, we need to encourage them to look over to the right, because of course we can't let them think that there's never going to be an object on the right side. So just because they lack the vision there doesn't mean something won't be there. So we need to encourage them to search. Um, we may need to increase print size. We may need to um, introduce them to some magnifiers or some type of magnification. We may also need to present materials on a high contrast background. Too many items presented at once or too close may also be a challenge. So we need to minimize visual complexity. We need to keep objects and images simple with nothing in the background. We may only be able to present one or two items at a time in isolation. We also need to be aware of the lighting environment and adjust the lighting as needed. Some, some children do really well if the lighting is dimmed. Some may need high illumination. We need to be aware of glare, um, particularly if things are laminated. We need to be aware of where the child is positioned and if the sun's coming in the windows or other light sources, if that's affecting any glare as well. Some of our children with ONH may need tinted lenses or some sunglasses or maybe a hat, or we may need to put some type of covering on the overhead lighting. Um, also, oftentimes our kiddos with ONH may have some depth perception challenges because one eye may be significantly stronger or greater than the other. In that case, we can include any fine and gross motor activities, container play, nesting, stacking, tossing or rolling a ball back and forth, pouring, or larger movements like practicing with stairs, slides and crawling will all help with depth perception as well. Okay, so in conclusion, children with ONH do have a variety of unique strengths and challenges as we discussed today, but we also know that strategies can be implemented that will help them with their behavior and sensory needs, social skill development, language development, and visual needs in the home and classroom. So collaborating with other professionals is definitely critical. Um, it's very important because ONH is a complex diagnosis as you, as you learn from part one and part two. Children with ONH do need all disciplines to understand the diagnosis and their unique needs, which is why it's important for us to collaborate with all of the disciplines to make sure that the strategies help the whole child and not just bits and pieces. And we will share now some resources and we also have part three collaboration on September 12th. So we have a few minutes. We've got about 10, 15 minutes if anybody does have any questions. I'm trying to go back through the chat because I couldn't do it and not mess up your slides. <laughs> I'm trying to look back through the, through the I questions. Understand. I saw one way back at the beginning about um, evaluating a child for CVI when I'm using those CVI strategies. I just want to be clear. These are just, I'm using the CVI strategies for my students with ONH. So these students do not, I mean, all those students can have both. I was just talking about my kiddos who just have ONH and I use these strategies that are designed for students with CVI. I feel that they do benefit my students. So I wouldn't have to do the CVI range for those students because they don't have a CVI diagnosis. Okay. Did you see any others, Sarah? Well, I, um, 
you might lucky. this is Olaya. I'm looking through as well. There was there was <laughs> a lot of comments, there were a lot of questions. I have I see one here. Do you usually conduct a CVI range for those kiddos you just mentioned or just use the strategies? Yeah, so that's what I was just addressing. That if oh, okay. they don't have a CVI diagnosis, then I would not. Now there are students who do have both, and then yes, we would, but um I was just thinking of I'm just using these strategies for any child with ONH because I think they help because I think they're useful. And then there was one by, um, we have Christopher, um, his, I, I can't see the last name very well. Give me one second. Oh, where did it go? Sorry, I can't see his last name really well, but uh, on here, cause it's cut off. What about situations where kids revert to music, areas of interest or other calming behaviors that aren't socially appropriate because of lack of access to their environment? Um, he says, I did this and I suspect a lot of the other kids whose families I've worked with do this. Now this, um, Chris, the, um, I'm sorry, yeah, Christopher, he mentioned that his name was mentioned at the last ONH webinar. Yes, he has ONH, yes. Okay, <laughs> yes, okay. So, yeah, so, so that was I one know, of I, So what would we do if they revert? I'm trying to find how he, okay, um, that they aren't socially appropriate. So we try to find activities that are socially appropriate. I mean, using music or calming behaviors can be socially appropriate. And we talked about giving those sensory breaks. So maybe that's the best way to answer it is that make sure kids get an opportunity to do calming activities so that they're, you know, they're not doing socially inappropriate activities, you know, make sure that they are getting a chance to have those breaks throughout their day, whether it's to provide more sensory or to escape too much sensory input. And that's how I would answer that. Sarah, do you have any other comments on that? No, because I agree. I mean, sometimes it can be appropriate. So we just have to find, if we think it's inappropriate, we just have to find something that's appropriate to replace it with. Um, but I, I mean, I, I think I saw this in here too somewhere. Sometimes I think it is a matter of just being overstimulated. So if it would be appropriate just to kind of remove them and do give them that break. Um, I mean, I, I, yeah, somebody wanted the resource page. Yeah, and we um we gave our presentation as a PDF. I yeah, and I uh, it's it's been uploaded. It wasn't uploaded okay, to the website to the where we where we archive them, but it's there now. So okay. I put the link in the chat. I'll I'll put it again. Great. So anybody who wants to have these, have our slides and have our resources, you should be able to get that PDF and then you can, you don't have to take notes. Yeah, I just put it back in there. There was a, a question early on about, and let me find it, about, um, about kids with um, like static electricity. And I wasn't sure what that was about. What about the buildup of static electricity? My student gets shocked all the time. And that was from Kathleen Curatolo or Curatolo. I'm not sure where the accent is on that. I'm not sure why. I, I wish I could. I wish she could comment again. And to, is it because the child's dragging their feet, or like I'm not sure why. I haven't had that experience with okay. students. Okay. But okay. I did see a question about autism, and I just we did touch upon that in part one. That's a really huge can mm -hmm. of worms to mm -hmm. talk about ONH and autism, but I. Do say if you're interested in exploring that, I would read um, articles written by Dr. Therese Politko because she does a great job of explaining the similarities between, um, you say SOD, the person who asked me, septo optic dysplasia, um, ONH, SOD, and autism, and then how uh, those diagnoses can be confounded. And I guess it's really important to just find someone who is an expert you know you, you need to find someone who really understands onh if you're looking for that diagnosis so there are a definite portion of our students who have autism but there are also students who have autistic like behaviors who don't so i hope that wasn't too confusing I read dr Fleco's articles <laughs> <to> help <laughs> I think you addressed this too already. Um, let me see. This was from Amanda. She asked, I'm curious if kids with ONH often demonstrate characteristics of CVI. But I think you guys have kind of talked about that already, but I, I just want to be sure that we address that if we have I find that early, I find that early on, this is personal experience that especially when they're really young, 
um, and their visual reactions seemed to be pretty minimal at the time. Those CVI character, or those CVI strategies actually work best. Um, and then as the child gets older and I think starts realizing that like they do have some vision and it is functional and we start seeing more consistent and stronger visual reactions and I can kind of pull away from those CVI strategies. But initially I do, I, I, I do use those strategies quite often in the beginning. And remember, I think one of the big things is need drives like the services, not necessarily right. the, the label. So, right. you know, if you find that the kid benefits from that, then do it right. <laughs> that, because that's what they need. Right. right. Um, I think the I wanna, other, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, Sarah. I was going to say, I saw that there's a lot of comments on echolalia and I just wanted to touch on that. And I think Dr. Mm -hmm. Paletko commented. So thank you. Um, but I, and I think she said this as well. I see echolalia a lot as they don't have the language, but they want to talk, right? They want a conversation. They want to know somebody is there. And so they're just repeating what they've already heard. Mm -hmm. um, so I see that. I think Dr. Pletko said that it's kind of like an enter to, like, to get a conversation started. Um, so I do see that quite a bit too. And then I think somebody asked about receptive and expressive. Um, talk more about receptive versus expressive, clarify the difference. So receptive language is like understanding what we're telling you um, and expressive is being able to express that, whether it's verbally or through sign. Um, so I'm trying to like, I do have kiddos that they understand that this is a ball and this is a book um, but they may not be able to express that. They may not be able to like verbally or with sign or whatever it may be to express that they know that. Yeah, and we have kids who both have higher receptive and we also have kids who have higher expressive. Um, and sometimes we see higher expressive when kids are having trouble kind of tuning out all of the sensory that they're overwhelmed by. So they're overwhelmed by sounds and textures and temperature and all of that. So they're not really able to process what they're hearing. So we see both, both types of language delays in either expressive or receptive. But that's why you know we look at, like Sarah said, look at your child's functioning in terms of both. And then you can look at which strategy would support them best. Um, and then there, it looks like there was somebody said that could, uh, Patty, could you show the resources slide again, please? Oh, it's up. Right. I had that okay. up. Did I, did I hit it yeah. again? No, no, it's no, no, it's there. It's there. I was just <laughs> too busy looking in the chat box. Um, you talked about the echolalia. Um, can, and then Dawn had a question about, can you please remind me where to find info on emotional age? So there was a link at the bottom of my slide where I talked about social emotional development. Also, you could just go on activelearningspace.org. Um, they have lots of information on social emotional development. Um, and then, you know, if you just, I don't know if you're a teacher or a parent, any social emotional developmental inventory would have information about that. Like we use the Oregon assessment, although we don't usually assess social in Illinois, um, but we, we can look at that and le at least get an idea. And then Susie had a question about, uh, can an ONH kiddo use a video magnifier or is that too much sensory input? Can I expect independence for this? So with babies, we haven't had a lot of experience <laughs> with video <laughs> yeah. um, But I would say that that would be an assessment that could be performed on a school age student. And I, I don't see why you wouldn't give it a try if you could you know, do an appropriate technology assessment. What do you think, Sarah? I, yes, I agree. I mean, I was just thinking like with our little ones, we don't really have that opportunity. Um, but I also think it really just depends on the uniqueness of each child. I think that some of my ONH kiddos could probably um, use that accommodation while others may not. So again, I, I just think it's a good assessment to determine if that's what would work well. And Christopher had a, just a comment about echolalia. Um, 
that I also think echolalia can be a form of processing, much like the self stimulate uh, behaviors, we can expect like hand flapping or rocking, interesting interpretation. That was his comment. Thank you. Yeah, echolalia is a, it's a tough one. I think there's a lot of, um, like there's a lot of reasons I think that a child could participate in echolalia. Yeah, did you see the comment by Cynthia White saying that um, Millie Smith has uh, an article? Did you did you mention that already? Okay, wasn't sure. All right, let's see. Well, I saw a question about muscle tone. That's just something we talked about in part one, where those midline brain differences can lead to muscle tone issues. And I don't know. I mean, I, the question was about particularly upper arms, but I just wouldn't be surprised at any type of muscle tone issue for a child with ONH, especially low tone, just given those um, neurological connections there. Um, and then somebody asked about what part three is gonna be about. Ooh, collaboration. <laughs> <laughs> so we are working on, I think it's September 12th, September 12th. Um, 1 p.m. Central Time, so 2 p.m. Eastern. Um, it will be on collaboration, and we will. Our hope is that we will have um, a couple other disciplines joining us, um, so that we can share how all disciplines need to work together while working with a child with ONH. Great. Um, oh, I see someone said, can we advocate for the importance of TBIs in the early years? Yes, oh, yeah. <laughs> we do. We try to. It is, um, it, it's vital. I mean, as parents, Sarah and I can both just give testimony, basically, um, that this is why I am in birth to three, because of the difference it made in my family's life. So not only my child, but my whole family, because we learned how to support her. We learned all of these tools and strategies and techniques that last a lifetime. Oh, Chris. Yes, I'm writing, writing name <laughs> for part three, <laughs> part three collaboration. Yeah, that would be great. And, and the, the thing with about like advocating, you know, with, with Family Connect um, and Connect Center, we really are trying to start more um like be more proactive with advocate you know teaching families how to advocate and um the ways to advocate who to who to advocate to um regarding you know tbis and and like you were saying early intervention um and so please stay tuned and you know check our website often um and as you are and of course as you're attending these webinars you'll learn more about the advocacy pieces as well um because really I mean, I, I'm not a parent of a child with a visual impairment, but I am a big advocate, but people, you know, the, the lawmakers, the legislators, you know, the people who make policy, they want to hear from the parents. They don't want to hear from people like me. And so really parents, you have the biggest voice um, to help. So um, please stay tuned and, you know, follow Sarah and Julia's lead because they, they know what they're talking about and they, you know, they're good advocates in and of themselves. Sarah, do you see Dr. Poletko says she'll join us? Yes, we have room. We have room. <laughs> <writing. laughs> we are writing the names down. Yes. So we, um, yes, we, Julie and I will definitely be in touch with both of you and we will, um, you know, get something figured out. So I definitely appreciate you guys offering to help us. I think that's great. Yes, thank you. It takes a village, right? <laughs> it does. That, I mean, that was our whole point is that these children are so complex that no one provider has all of the answers to what families might be dealing with. So, yeah, you are absolutely are you right. At that last that. question about yeah, Heather, um, Heather, can you write down my email and send me an email? Because I, I'd like to talk to you outside of this because you say you're in Chicago. So if you could shoot me an email and. Um, yep, we're in Illinois, we might be able to help. <laughs> yes, yeah. All right, okay, one second. Okay, well, thank you again so much, Sarah and Julia. Always enjoy having you guys. And I always learn so much every time I'm in your webinars. Uh, makes me a better practitioner and a better advocate too. So um, thanks for sharing all of that. And uh, our next scheduled time, like you said earlier, September 12th, 
right? Yeah. Um, and so um, everybody, please stay tuned for when that registration link comes up and we will look forward to seeing everybody with us again. So thank you so much, everyone. Have a good day evening. <laughs> thank you. Bye, everyone.